I am super excited about this podcast. Um, Santa Muerte is, is an object of, is, is super fascinating to me. I know that this is one of the largest growing religions in the world. I don't know a whole lot about it, and I want to. There's a lot of things in magic that are kind of old hat for me that are good, like meditation, but I find myself repeating a lot. This is not one of them. So why don't we just dive in? If you want to tell me, tell the audience a little bit about your book and who you are. My name is Dr. Cressida Stone. That's a, a pseudonym, obviously, which I chose because Cressida is an old word meaning gold and stone obviously means a stone and i wanted within my book for people to find nuggets of gold so that's why i chose that name and in actuality i am a doctor of anthropology i obtained my degree at oxford university in england and santa muerte is the female folk saint of death but I would correct that and say also of life, because this is a non-dualistic tradition originating in Mexico. And while this has often been dubbed as a new religious movement, I, I think that's erroneous. I think that's fallacious. Yeah. Um, whilst I said that, you know, as an academic, when I commenced my work, I, I think that's a misnomer. Because if we look at ancient Mexico, and indeed, if we look across the world, there have always been death deities. And Santa Muerte really, for me, in, in my mind, is a reiteration of ancient death deities, such as the Aztec death deity, Mixticasihuato. Uh, there's also, you know, we, we always tend to focus on the, the Aztec, but there's also the Zapotec, there's also the Maya, there's also the Mixtec, and they also had their own death deities. For example, very few people know this, but I'm I'm an, an anthropology geek and I love to do ethno-archaeological research and look at the ancient codices and, you know, ancient beliefs and tracking those. And what I have discovered is that if you look at the Zapotec, they had ancient death deities such as Shonashi Kwekuya and her husband Pitao Pizalao, a couple that were worshipped at a place called Mitla that is is still um, open to visits today and is a cultural heritage center. So for people who don't know, who is Santa Muerte? Let's just start off with that, defining this deity, um, who she is and and uh where she's worshipped. She is a, a female folk saint, and she derives from an amalgamation of... She's syncretic. So she emerged in the, in the colony of New Spain, which was what Mexico was known as. So in New Spain, the colonial conquistadores, the Spanish, came along, and they wanted to convert people to Christianity. So they brought with them the figure of the Grim Reaper, known in Spanish as La Parca. Now, this is a female figure of death because death in the Latin countries is generally perceived of symbolically, iconographically as female because death in the Latin languages is la muerte, la mort in French, right? And so iconographically represented as female. Now, they brought this figure in to an environment where death deities were already being worshipped by local people, where there was already ancestor veneration and where there were rich traditions of this. And we always, I mean, you know a lot about uh, Vodou, Jason, and how that's a syncretic religion. Now, we always think that when people convert other people, we often make the mistake to, to think that it's just like a program that gets uploaded on your computer and the app's just there. It's not the case. When people encounter a new religion or a new tradition, they always perceive it in terms of their own cultural context, their own metaphysics, their own eschatologies. So in the case of Santa Muerte, this figure of the Grim Reaper obviously was brought in by the Catholic clergy, by the Spanish, to convert indigenous people and try and stop them from worshipping what they saw as pagan idols. 
right? Um, try to eradicate local worship, including of death deities. So they brought in all sorts of figures, you know, J Jesus, Mary, statues of the Grim Reaper. And of course, the Grim Reaper in Christian eschatology is simply a symbol of death. Nobody worships the Grim Reaper. It simply personifies death. And we can go more into where the Grim Reaper originates from if, if you want. Yeah, yeah, I actually am very interested in that because I don't know. Do you want me to go into that now? Um, well, maybe maybe finish maybe finish this point, and then maybe just okay. a brief sidebar at the end. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and they bring in all sorts of saints, right? Saint Jude, Santa Marta, Saint Martha, for example, all these different saints. So, local people see this figure of the Grim Reaper, and they're told about a Santa Muerte, a Buena Muerte they say in Spanish. And the idea there was to have a good death, right? A sin-free death. Uh, because in Catholic traditions, it's all, you know, and Memento Mori was happening at this time, Vanitas, Homo Bulo Est. I don't know if you know about all these concepts. I, I know the first one, but explain them for, for, I don't know the other two. And so maybe explain the three briefly. Well, you have to remember that this is, the Grim Reaper emerges from a time post-plague Right, where lots of people had died. And how is the Catholic Church going to wield religion to help people, and, and even capitalize potentially on this situation? They're going to tell people they need to be pious, right? that they need to have a good death, una buena muerte. And there's all this idea of memento mori, remember that you will die, so you should behave. Be a good lad and lass if you want to gain entry into the pearly gates and you don't want to go to... Um, to hell, right? To, to, to the fire pits of hell. So they're teaching this eschatology using the figure of the grim reaper as a warning. And of course, death in the Christian tradition is about finality. It's the opposite of life. It's perceived as something we don't want, but when we get there, we want a good death, right? So you want to pray, you want to confess. So they bring this figure in, these notions in to Mexico. But people are not seeing them in this light. They are seeing them with their own cultural background, their own cultural choreography, as I can fancily put it in fancy terminology, but you know, their own cultural context. And that context is worshiping death deities for favors of life, potentially giving, you know, blood offerings to them. Bloodletting to your ancestors was was very um, pertinent and, and a practice that was often done by the Zapotec, the Maya, the Aztec, right? You 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 slit a body part, uh, genitals, earlobes, uh, your tongue potentially with an obsidian blade or a stingray tail, and you gave your blood to your ancestors um, or to the gods to, to bring forth vision. So there were all these practices around ancestor, dead ancestor worship, and there were all these practices around death deities who were venerated. So when they see the figure of the Grim Reaper and they're being told about una santa muerte, a holy death, a good death, they're thinking, well, no, this is a saint. They start to perceive that Santa Muerte is a saint in her own right with powers and so when we look at the early colonial records, you know, which are very difficult to decipher because they're written by missionaries who have heavy bias, right? right? And who were writing according to their own religious background. They are reporting that people are heretically, in their mind, worshipping, in, especially in central Mexico, we see this, the figure of death, La Santísima Muerte, and they're literally calling it La Santa Muerte, and, and asking her for political favors. And even there, there's records of curanderos, shamans, turning to images of this figure of death for diagnosis, for healing. So that is her early inception. Now, she's probably very different. I would say that she's a different figure from today, because I think death keeps on reappearing in many different guises, many different iterations across time. 
And obviously, religion is in p- perpetuum mobile, right? It's always always changing in terms of context, needs, etc. But what we discover is we have no records, barring the colonial records of anything to do with Santa Muerte, until the 1930s and the 1940s, uh, I think actually 1940s, 1950s, when we encountered three anthropologists, uh, two Mexican and one American, who report that they have come across in Mexico people worshipping the figure of death. And so women turning to Santa Muerte for favors of love, and Afro-Mexicans in uh, in a place which is on the border of Guerrero and Oaxaca turning to her as, as well. And we see that there's further syncretism here where this is not just indigenous death deity worship, saint worship coming from Catholicism, but also magic, magical practices, which must have come in not only, you know, we always put the focus very Eurocentrically, at least that's what I've encountered in the academic work. Oh, this is medieval Spanish magic. Yes, it is, but we mustn't forget that the Aztec, the Maya, the Mixtec, all these people had also had their own magic. They had curanderismo, shame, shamanic practices, and they were also worshipping and turning to deities for, for magical favors. So Santa Muerte, since this time, has taken on all sorts of guises and influences, including from, I'd say, New Age, Santaria, even sometimes there's an interplay from that, Candomblé. So she's a very syncretic figure. And if you go to different places across Mexico, you'll find she's she's worshipped, venerated in some ways that are similar. You know, there's a bottom line that there's sort of certain key tenets, which I go over in the book. But also people are venerated. This is, you know, there's heteropraxy and heterodoxy, especially heteropraxy, which means multiple ways of, of practicing this. So I've worked in particular in, in indigenous areas, working with curanderos who are really, you know, tapping into the old ways of working with her. Uh, I mean, I worked in more rural environments, but but there's also more urban worship uh, such as that, you know, in Mexico City, which which I'm aware of, and I've I've visited the main chapel there. But my interest as an anthropologist is really in these recondite, very occult, esoteric ways of worshiping her that can be found in in rural Mexico. When you say uh, esoteric and recondite, I mean we're talking about like extremely complex uh, folk magic pr- procedures or something. What? Are, yeah. And I would say the thing that I love about Santa Muerte is that while you can ask her for practical favors, and we can go over the color coding in a moment because you work with different colors of Santa Muerte to, you know, tap into that energy. I mean, Santa Muerte comes in black, red, white, yellow, pink, green, gold, Are are those all aspects? They are all different aspects. Wow. And people I had no idea. Tell... That's like uh, Tara in Buddhism or something. That's that. That's fascinating. So, you know, in a way, she's kind of almost like a shapeshifter, and, which makes sense because, of course, in Mexico, you know, shapeshifters, Nahuales, are, are, are part of mythology and, and a very important thing. And, and, of course, you know, the purple one is on my book because purple is associated with magic, mystery, and... To get back to what I was saying, so she's very practical and you can turn to her for highly practical favors as many people do in Mexico. You know, for example, turn to red Santa Muerte for love, turn to golden Santa Muerte for favors of money, financial help, turn to green Santa Muerte for legal problems, court cases, etc. Turn to blue Santa Muerte for, for studies, for focus, turn to white Santa Muerte for peace, harmony, healing. Yeah, I could go over more colors, but we'll be here, you know, a long time and we can get back into that later. But my point here is, is while you can be extremely practical with her, you can also get very philosophical with her. And that's what I found was beautiful for me working in this highly indigenous area where there is a lot of curanderismo, is that you can turn to death to learn about the secrets of life and death. 
And that's why I call my book Secrets of Santa Muerte, not to say that I have all the secrets, but that Santa Muerte can teach you secrets about yourself, about life, about metaphysics. I mean, there's a whole epistemology to this if you're open to it. And not everyone's working with her in this way, and you don't have to if you want to be purely practical and say, you know, Jason, you're like, okay, I want a new job. I want to be making lots of money. You can just turn to her for that. But if you have more esoteric philosophical goals, which I personally have, then you can work with her for that. And and I find that a lot of people that do work with her or came across her, as I did myself, have been through near-death experiences. Whether it's a physical near-death experience where you nearly died, which in my case, I, I nearly did. Um, what was that? What was that story? What happened there? I mean, there are several. Um, I allude to a car crash in my book, which you know was was very traumatic for me. And your readers can can read about that. Uh, the the readers of my book can read about that. But also, the second time I went to Mexico, I had had a very serious operation, and it went wrong. I started hemorrhaging on an operating table, and it was, I was very, very lonely and, and it was very lonely and frightening because I was in, you know, I'd moved from England to another country, which was foreign to me. I didn't know anybody. I, I didn't have anyone there. There was no one I could reach out to. And, and I literally felt like I saw a figure of death. I thought I was going to die. And it was a very humbling experience. And I don't think everyone that works with Santa Muerte needs to go through this you know, kind of thing, but I found that a lot of people have experienced death of the ego in a way, or you know, their whole sense of self has been dissolved by a very difficult experience. And it could be like me, you know, a near-death experience, but it could also be a divorce, you know, or a business going bankrupt. Uh. Something that takes you to rock bottom where your whole sense of self and who you thought you were is completely dissolved and you have to take a step back and that demands huge healing. And so that's why I say Santa Muerte is the folk state of life and death because she gave me a rebirth as a new sort of person who, you know, I, I didn't, this person that I am today didn't exist before meeting her so i think that when you, you can have give you that what do you what do you mean by that by what when you say she gave you a new life what what is what do you mean by that specifically well i was very sick the second time i went to mexico and you know i didn't know who i was anymore i'd come from white privilege you know even though i'd had hard experiences in my life you know and and experienced as as many women do you know harassment things that had i have found very difficult to cope with i still had this solid sense of of self and we discussed this one day uh, i teach at a university with my students and we spoke about um jesus and now it doesn't matter whether you believe in the mythology or not to be true. But when you look at when Jesus died on the cross, you know, he was crucified. That was a very difficult experience. He was, he had nails in his hands. He was bleeding, left outside for days on this cross. And he was betrayed by his good friend, right? I believe it was Judas. Mm -hmm. and, and that was just a horrible experience for Jesus. But then he was resurrected and became this new supernatural powerful being and i think that we in ourselves can learn from that and i think that santa muerte teaches us that lesson as well is that death is very hard death of the self of the ego is extremely difficult yeah. you know i thought that i was immortal before this this car accident before this operation you know i didn't question my sense of self I had come from white privilege. You know, I went to Oxford University, which is extremely, I mean, I'm not bragging here. I'm, I'm just stating a fact, extremely difficult to get into. I mean, 0.01% mm -hmm. of the world's population have a doctorate, let alone from Oxford. So I had all these things and I, I, and I thought I was the cat's pajamas in a way, the bee's knees. 
the ink in the squid. I really did. For, you know, I was, I mean, I wasn't hugely egocentric, but I thought, you know, I've got a lot going on. And then when all of this happened to me, I thought, well, who am I really? What am I? I'm just a walking skeleton. And that essentially is what Santa Muerte is and teaches us, is that we are just wow. walking skeletons and our time on earth is is finite. But as I said, she's life and death. So I find that most devotees are not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of death. I'm afraid of pain and suffering because I've already been there. But I'm not afraid of of death anymore. How would you say that working with Santa Muerte has transformed your relationship with death? I mean, you've said quite a bit already, but if maybe you could talk I think about the, the point there. Through Santa Muerte, we can reclaim our relationship with death, which, you know, is very lost in, I would say, Euro-American society. It's hidden also. It's very hidden. It's very covert. In Mexico, it's not. And she's taught me a lot of lessons about that. And, and she's taught me through this death of the ego as well, that everyone is equal. That just because I have a degree from wherever, it doesn't make me better than the next person. And I've been put in touch with a lot of people through my work that I never expected, um, you know, 10 years ago that I would speak to. For example, people that are very close to death in different ways. People have written to me with terminal illnesses. People have written to me that have had, you know, total breakdowns, been suicidal. People who work in, I'm not going to lie, you know, illegal businesses mm -hmm. where their life is on the line because of the kinds of things. And you can imagine the kind of people that that might be in Mexico. I mean, I do tarot readings. And as part of my apprenticeship, when I apprenticed with a witch, a bruja of Santa Muerte, she asked me to read tarot for her clients. And I met people who ask me very shocking questions directly about death. And when I do a tarot reading, I don't know about you, Jason, I know you're very into tarot as well. I'm not really, although I'm reading the cards, I'm more just reading the energy and letting it yeah. engulf me. Yeah, yeah. And so... Are you talking about cartel stuff? I guess you yes. know. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't want to go that. too much into pretty that obvious. for my own safety. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, but I'll give you an example. You know, I mean, before I went to Mexico, people, I would do tarot for people. I've been doing it for years uh, for clients and for friends and family. And people will ask me things like, you know, does he love me? Which is fine, you know, and I I'm happy to do those kinds of readings. But when I went one time to Mexico and I said to Santa Muerte, I went to this very sacred chapel and I said to her, show me the secrets of life and death. I I'm ready for what you want to teach me. And she taught me through sensation, through feeling, it's very hard to describe, but I had to do tarot readings on very, very difficult and serious situations. For example, someone came to me who is involved in, you know, cartel activity and told me that someone that they worked with had disappeared and they wanted to know what had happened to them. And could I look in the cards? And I did. And when I did, I had to go through their death because I don't know about you, Jason, but when you read cards, sometimes you can live things that other people have gone through. And so that, when I saw that person's death, it was very violent. It was very awful. I saw all the details and I reported it to the person. I relayed everything. And, and I felt that death within my body. It was as if I had experienced it. How, how did this person die? They were kidnapped. They were tortured. They were kept in a, a place for a while and, and you know, um, information was extricated from them through, through violent means. And then finally they were killed. So that was very hard for me to see how, especially yeah, that's coming the from... that's the last thing i <laughs> that's like the last thing i would want to deal with in any I, I, well in any context but certainly that one that's brave of you um and, and i came home you know to my lodgings and i i was shivering but it, it was a big lesson to me because i'd asked her you know be careful what you ask for with santa muerte she will come through if you form that bond with her and, and you know you don't have to ask for these things that i'm asking for i'm you know i'm a 
a seeker of of esoteric knowledge and philosophical opening of my own mind. So I turned to her for that. But as I said, you can turn to her for favors of love, sex, money. You know, you don't have to go down the route <laughs> that I've gone that I've gone down. But it was very eye opening and good for me because again, it took away my sense of self in a way and my sense of privilege. And I realized that people go through very difficult things. And I, and it also made me question, you know, who are the narcos? A lot of times we get these horrible depictions and I'm not saying that they're all wonderful people. There are sociopathic people out there. But what I learned is in Mexico, in the work that I do, that lots of people who get involved are, are people, you know, who are living on less than $10 a day and that there is no upward mobility in Mexico. So if you don't get involved in this, then you're, you're pretty much going to live in desperate poverty for all of your life. And if you have some kind of financial emergency, which we've all experienced, right? You might need an urgent surgery or a family member does. What are you going to do about money? Right? Right. It's very easy to, to be convinced. And you can ask young people, oh, what do you want to do when you grow up? Oh, I want to be a vet. But you know, how, how are they really going to be a vet? Most people there don't go to university. So I've just learned so many lessons and she's put me in touch with people also who you know have drug problems, who are addicted or take drugs that put their life in, in danger. Um, and so all of that has caused me to question myself and am I any better than these people? these people. Now, this is, you know, my work is very serious, what I'm doing, because I've committed myself to that sort of thing. But, you know, Santa Muerte, as I said, is eminently practical. You don't need to go down this path with her. If you want, if you just need a legal favor, or if you want protection, you can go to La Nina Negra, Black Santa Muerte, for example. Or if you want vengeance, because she's amoral, right? Death is amoral. And anybody, by the way, can be a devotee of death. If you go yeah, I was to... going to ask you that because obviously we hit kind of potential issues of cultural uh, appropriation here, but what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are if you go to Mexico and ask people about that, they'll tell you that's ridiculous. I mean, go to Mexico before in, you... In my experience, that's true of almost all religions. So it's very... People are just excited that you're interesting and interested, which is why I, I get... It's a little silly that people get stressed about this, but yeah. I mean, if people were misusing it, in a misguided way, which I found that mostly they are not. I mean, most people, as I said, that turn to Santa Muerte to do so because they have, you know, quite serious problems that they want her to, to help. They, they need her help to resolve. You know, if you're just using her as a fashion statement, you know, maybe that's something else. And maybe, you know, you could be accused of, of cultural appropriation. But I've found that most people are not doing this for a fashion statement. Most people are doing this because they have very real needs and 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 requirements um and spiritually they're looking for something and you know death death is universal i mean there are other parallels which i would say are not the same as santa muerte but have similar attributes like kali right like sure, sure. hell in norse mythology we can look at you know that there are, exactly hecate so, and if you actually ask Mexican people, is this cultural appropriation? They said, well, of course, everybody dies, right? The only person that might be exempt is an immortal, but hey, is, is anybody immortal? And, and that's why I think Santa Muerte is the perfect spirituality for the times we're living in, because we're living in postmodern times, or some people say post-postmodern times, where nothing is known to be true right? Where it's all fake news, where it's all narratives being spun by different groups of people. You know, you know we can't believe in anything anymore. But the one truth, huh. the one true thing in our lives that we can all count on is that we will die. So as people have told me in Mexico, death is the only truth and nobody is exempt from death, black, white, rich, poor. And this is why she judges no one and anybody can be a, a devotee, gay, straight. It really doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter what your vocation is, you know, whether you're working in an illegal job or, or not, whether you're a housewife, whether you're, you know, I've met people from all walks of life who, who work with Santa Muerte. And so she's open to everybody because we're all essentially walking skeletons, mm. which is what 
she is. Yeah, if I can just relate a brief story just to add to what you're saying, just because it's bringing it, uh, I'm thinking of it as you're talking about uh, the fact that, you know, everyone is basically the same and talking about ego deaths. Uh, I had a, when I still lived in LA, I kind of did one of my shamanic drift uh, drifts, which I do from time to time around East LA, which is just trancing out and wandering in the urban environment. And I ended up coming to the Temple of Santa Muerte. There's a full temple in East LA. Mm -hmm. I think it's very famous. La Basilica. I, okay. Is it La Basilica? Uh, I think it was just called temp, Temple. Santa. Oh, Templo. Templo de Santa Muerte. Yeah, yeah. Templo, yeah, yeah. So, um, so you've been there. So you perhaps you, uh, I'm guessing, so you, you may know the statue I'm talking about. It was in the middle of the night and I it kind of came up, just randomly happened upon it. And the statue of Santa Muerte I was looking at, the cloak, the robe she was wearing was covered with dollar bills. And I was like, okay, like message received. Basically, we're all running around. Everyone is running around chasing money and then you're dead. And it's like the whole world is like that. And I think like the world was on fire that she was holding or something like that, just from the whatever that is. You but know. people also give her dollar bills for favors of money, right? Because as I said, she's eminently practical. So you got your own message from that. And that's the beauty of Santa Muerte. Oh, interesting. So maybe that was just a money shrine that I then layered this whole story on top of. That's okay. You know, that's what I'm saying about Santa Muerte is that it's difficult to codify. And, you know, the book is a useful guideline. But as I point out in the book, you've got to find your way to work with her. You've got to find the messages that she wants to give to you because she is very communicative. And she will, if you establish a relationship with her, she will send you signs and signals. I mean, I've got information on that in the book on how to conduct ceromancy, which is divination through candle work, mm -hmm. how to look out for animal and insect omens, because those are often messages. And I talk a lot about dream work work as well. And, and I talk about, you know, people can use tarot if they want. You've got to find what works for you. You know, not everybody is a tarot reader. I mean, some of us are naturals like myself and, and yourself, Jason, and, and that's something that we, we love to work far. with. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, some of us feel very strongly about that and, and, and feel that we have natural gifts and aptitudes. I mean, I've had precognitive abilities since I was a small child. So um, and that's what I've loved about this, this faith is that it's very, I'd say it's a counter spirituality, a counter epistemology to, you know, the logos that we experience in the scientific rhetoric and, and, you know, that the state yeah. impels us to follow. Whereas Santa Muerte, for those of us who are very drawn to the occult, the esoteric, the intuitive, this is a spirituality that encourages us to embrace that and work with these talents to communicate with her. And, you know, she often travels with her owl and you can ask her owl as well for, for messages. You can ask her to visit you in dreams, which, which I do. And, and I give even, you know, entheogenic substances that, that you can use if you want to communicate and work with her that way. Any specific ones? Cartel cocaine? <laughs> I don't know that cocaine is going to give you the visions that you want. I mean, as I said, it really depends. Not good for ego death either. It depends what floats your boat. I mean, in Mexico, people in the region I go to, there's a lot of psilobison use, magic mushroom use. There's also a flower that I'm guessing is morning glory because nobody can tell me what it's called. Oh, no in Spanish, but it's a oh, purple no. flower. So I've done my research and I believe it to be that. But also from people who don't necessarily want to, I mean, you can also, you know, Santa Muerte loves to smoke up with you, Wait, by is, the way. Is it morning if you're, uh, Wait, sorry, I, I just interrupted you. What did you say? Well, I said, if you'd like to smoke up or even get a little bit tipsy, you know, what I love about Santa Muerte is she's all about convivencia, which means sharing and enjoying good times. So if you want to light up a blunt or, you know, have a shot of tequila, do it with her, you know, and she will appreciate that. So you can, you know, you can get high with Santa Muerte. And, and again, <laughs> this is amoral, you know, she's a folk saint, she's folk Catholic, but, yeah. 
But there's no sin here. So you can do what you want, Jason. But you wanted to tell me something about Morning Glory. Oh, uh, Morning Glory, is that, that's Datura, right? Yes. Good. Yes. God, no wonder they're seeing Grim Reaper visions and things like that. It's like you ever read Datura trip reports on Eurowood? It's, <laughs> yeah. like, it's like literally, it's like I took this and then blood started pouring out of books and a werewolf came out of the oven. It's just like, yeah, I have a and friend. Then I, and then I it. ended up in the ER with a catheter <laughs> still on Datura. Your friend took it. What happened? They said they're never going to take it again. They said out of everything they have ever tried, and believe you me, this is a person who has dabbled in a lot of things. They were like, that was insane. They had never experienced anything like it. So they say any specifics? Uh, I don't want to share their story without their <laughs> permission. You okay. know, I, I use a pseudonym. I'm very careful about people's privacy. So, you know, my own privacy. So, yeah. I, I'm I'm fairly convinced that um, all of that medieval demonology grimoire stuff just comes straight out of people abusing Datura, because that's what people that's the type of stuff people see when they take it demonic entities and that type of thing. Um, but more on a more subtle level, you know, if you don't want to get completely bongoed on this kind of stuff, bongoed. you can <laughs> you can yeah, just same. okay. Uh, yeah, um, you can just you know ask for for lucid dreams or astral um, astral dreaming, astral connections, and, and I highly recommend you know easily available everywhere is Valerian, right? Obvious one, mm -hmm. Mugwort also. If you want to be more in keeping culturally in keeping with Mexican traditions. You can look for Aztec bitter grass, also known as Aztec dream grass, which again is a very bitter herb similar to mugwort that allows for very intense dreams and, and dreams where you can connect with Santa Muerte or, or spiritual energy. Um, so you mentioned earlier that there are some key tenets of working with Santa Muerte. What would those be? Well, as they say in Mexico... Um, sin ofrenda, sin veladora y sin petición, Santa Muerte no escucha tu oración. So without a candle, an offering, and a petition, she's not going to hear your prayer. It doesn't sound as good in, in English, I'm afraid. You know, it rhymes beautifully yeah. in Spanish. Um, and so the idea is that you set up an altar to her, which is very simple to do. You don't even need to buy a statue. You can print out an image of her. And also, as I said, you know, this is a faith. It's not about money or materiality. It's about working with what you have. So if you love painting and you want to paint an image of Santa Muerte, or if you're good, you know, you've got some Halloween skeletal figure lying around, you want to dress it up, you can do that too. She absolutely loves it when you create devotional items that you have handcrafted. So all you need is an image, some kind of representation of her. I mean, I find even people will use just a skull, right? It's not important what, what you use as long as it can represent her in a respectful way. Set up your altar. As I said in my book, it needs to be an ideal space for communion. You know, you don't want it in your garage or somewhere hidden away that you're not going to see. It needs to be somewhere that you're going to pass by every day and 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 render homage, you know, to her at this at this place. And it needs to be a quiet place where you'll be undisturbed. You know, like any good religious space that you'll create in your in your house. So set up that space, cleanse it spiritually. I describe how to do that in the book. You can use a little table, a little alcove, anything that you can use. Even, you know, I've seen people set this up on, on a stool if, you know, you're bare bones or on the top of a bookshelf, whatever you have, bare bones, no pun intended. Um, so set up your altar with your image of Santa Muerte or your statue. Give her some water because she's a skeleton. She's supposedly, you know, quite uh, thirsty. Give her a candle and, and give some, you know, this is kind of almost melds into to wicker and, and witchcraft here where you should have something from, from each element. So you might want something of the earth, like a crystal, right? Um, also an offering of fruit, like an apple, 
for example. I suggest in my book, Not Sour Things, because your auto represents your connection with the spiritual world. So if you want sour things in your spiritual world, then put sour things there, right? But who wants sour things in their, in their world? So you've got your image or your, your statue. You've got your glass of water. Ideally, an alcoholic libation. I mean, if you want to be super Mexican, you can be tequila, you can put tequila, mezcal, but beer, whiskey, everything is welcome with Santa Muerte. You've got your your item from the earth, orange, maybe a bit too sour, apple, I prefer. And then you might want to give us some flowers if you've got money for that. And your candle, which is essential. Any candle will do. There are fancy Santa Muerte candles that you can buy if you're, especially if you're in the States or Mexico in Botanicas, in the place where I go to in Mexico, they call them naturalistas, stores that sell special Santa Muerte candles, but a plain white candle will do, right? It, it, this is not about expense. And then some incense or tobacco, because tobacco is an ancient uh, offering, you know, by indigenous people to the deities. Once you've got that, and you don't need to buy, none of these things need to be expensive, right? Prayer is the most important thing, regular prayer on, on a daily basis, and just finding ways to connect with her. And I found that prayer is, is a good way to do that. And, and perhaps meditating upon her image, anything that's going to bring you closer but as I said, this is not about heavy investment. It's really about doing the spiritual work. And then if you want, you can work with, with brujería, with witchcraft, with her. You can do spells, and I give spells in my book. But that's not a requisite. Different people like to work with her in different ways. Some people are purely prayer-based. Uh, and I talk about the novena, the nine-day prayer, which, you know, is almost like witchcraft. You know, the the Jason, as you know, the the lines between magic and religion are, are very blurry, and often we've tried to define those and delimit my, my those. My line is my line is very simple. If somebody else is telling you what to do, it's religion. If if, if they're not, <laughs> and it's your decision, if it's all just your decision, it's magic. Okay. <laughs> so a prayer, you know, is a, is is in a in a way a form of in my mind of magic as well, because you're setting an intention and you're repeating that every day and you're meditating on that and you're trying to control, as it were, or shape the energies of the universe in your favor, which essentially is, you know, what we do in, in magic. But you can really go to pure magic and, you know, start doing <sighs> hex jars or whatever you want, you know, things of that description as as well. What should people not do when working with Santa Muerte? Because I definitely get the vibe of uh, watch your manners. Um, what are things that people should definitely not do or avoid or that could be dangerous to do potentially? They should not be disrespectful. Uh, and, and they should watch their ego as well, I would say, and, and just be aware of who she is. I mean, do not joke around with death. And if you make a promise to her... so. You know, if you ask her for something, it's a very good idea to promise her something in return. So, for example, should we have a, a superficial example, or do you want a, a more deep one, Jason? You give a more you deep tell one, me. of course. A more deep one. Okay. So, let's say you're dealing with the death of a loved one, and you want healing from from that, and you want to ensure that your loved one's in a place of peace. Then you might say. Look, if I get now, let's let's go even further than that. Let's say you want a sign from your loved one, because of course Santa Muerte deals with the realms of the dead. So you can ask her to get messages from your beloved uh, dead people, you know, from an ancestor or from an ancestor or someone recently deceased. I hate saying beloved dead people, and in Spanish they have a better word for it, difuntos. I guess departed, but anyway, not the same thing. But anyway, you want a sign from your beloved who has died, you're heartbroken, you want a message from them, you are Santa Muerte, you turn to her to be a vessel and you get that very same night, you get a dream and your loved one appears to you, let's say, and they say, I love you, don't worry, I'm fine, I reached you know, the other side, I'm in heaven, I'm happy, whatever it is that they, they tell you. If you've promised her white roses, Give her those white roses and don't prevaricate. You know, don't be like, oh, next month I'll get you those roses. 
yeah. go and get her. And I have found, you know, when I first started writing academically, I made the mistake of, of following another academic who said that it's a quid pro quo with her. It, it's not. It's not a quid pro quo. It's not like, oh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. This is a very materialistic, capitalistic yeah. way of looking at things. It's more about building a deep relationship with well, her. How would she... you scratch Santa Mark? Like, what could you possibly do to? It's like people have this idea with with religion. Sometimes it's like, what what could you possibly do for a deity? I, I don't know. Exactly. What could you give them that they don't already have? Especially death, which owns everything, because we're all going to die. Yeah. Everything about us is going to go to ashes, to ashes, dust to dust. Right. Everything in this room, you, me, Jason, we all have an expiry date. So death ultimately owns us all. That's why she holds the globe, because the whole world, the whole universe, is her dominion. You know, so, if the universe ends one day, it is hers. So has I, I have to ask. What are your views of of existence after death or life after death? Have those changed from working with Santa Muerte? Um, I I sort of believe in reincarnation, and I find that a lot of devotees do, but some of them just believe in heaven, and and there really is no fixed doxa on this. It seems people have their own beliefs, but I had very weird experiences when I went to this one chapel in in Mexico in Oaxaca which is where I primarily done my work. I mean, I didn't say that in my book because I've been, one of Santa Muerte's sobricos is Lady of the Shadows. I've been a Lady of the Shadows myself. I tried to hide my identity for a long time because I'm a very private person. I'm an old school witch. I don't really want public attention. I just want to be in my little house in the woods yeah. doing my spells, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hanging out with other shamans curanderos, you know, and, and just immersing myself completely in that, you know, that is my love in life is writing, Wonderful. you know? Wonderful. Yeah. So anyway, where was I going with that? Um, Oaxaca. what was you, you what was talking, that? You were talking about going, going to Oaxaca. Yes. So going to Oaxaca, I mean, that just completely changed my whole mindset is a very spiritual place and i don't know where i was going with that sorry you'll have to refresh me i can't remember now either that you were oh we, i asked you about how your views on life after death yes that was it yeah. okay so going to thank you so going to oaxaca i had this incredible experience where i had to believe I feel like we have to believe in reincarnation, me and the people that I met there. Because when I met these people, even though, you know, I've come from my background, England, Oxford educated, some of the people that I got close to have had a completely different life to me, indigenous, growing, never have left Mexico. It was like we'd known each other for so many lifetimes. I mean, the communication, the friendships, the bonds were so deep that I felt, wow, this feels like a soul family. And very quickly I became involved in their life and, and was brought in to apprentice at a chapel and, and everything just flowed so magically. And, you know, and even when there's family problems, they call me <laughs> because so, I mean, that's my own experience, but I'm not afraid of death. So how is my my relationship with death has changed is that I used to be afraid of death. I used to ignore it. I used to not think about it or think, on the other hand, that I was immortal, that I would never die. Now I'm cognizant that I could die tomorrow. And I'm grateful for every day of life that I'm gifted. And I'm grateful for every day of life that my loved ones are gifted and that I get to spend with them. And I think that has completely altered my, my mindset. And I'm grateful even for this very moment with you, Jason. Me too. Every day above ground is a good day. That's how I feel. But I'm not afraid of death. And so that's the thing, even though I'm grateful for every breath, at the same time, although I'm afraid of pain and suffering and I, you know, I don't want to go through a painful death, I think that death will be, and I've spoken to other devotees about this, and, and we feel the same, that death will be very peaceful and relaxing and it's not something to, to fear. Well, that sounds lovely. Um, 
I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I've had I've had so many. I've had a bunch of I mean spiritual experiences where I've been convinced that I wasn't afraid of death for a while, but yeah, well, you know, then reality creeps up. Um, but it sounds like this is like a deep, kind of lasting uh, sense of peace for you. You know, like this is a, like has this? How long have you felt this way? Um, I suppose since really becoming deep with my devotion and with reading something that this wonderful witch wrote, um, this bruja, who she's featured on the back of my book, Soraya Arredondo Hernandez. She said to me one day, and I said, gosh, you know, I absolutely agree. She said, you know, it's not death that's hard. It's not death that's frightening. It's life that's difficult. It's life that gives us all these obstacles and challenges and rushing around. You know, when you reach death, you can finally chill out. You know, you can finally... Right. Or it's like, like a, you know, Charles Manson said, <laughs> dying is easy. Sometimes I'm afraid. Uh, sometimes I'm afraid. Uh, some, some dying is easy. Sometimes I think I'm afraid to live is or his or his words. OK, uh, well, to, you know, as Heidegger yeah. said, so let's let's bring, let's it up. Let's bring the tone up. As um, Heidegger said, you know, we're all beings, beings towards death. And, even and as more, they say, even in Mexico, more controversial than Charles Manson, Heidegger. Yeah, that's true. Um, but let's bring it back to Mexico. La vida es un paso a la muerte. Life is just only a path to death. So once you're cognizant of that, you know, just stop being afraid. It happens to everybody. Just chill out with it. Is my is my was message? It that simple. That was just kind of the the, the change of attitude that you just. I think that. For me, when I asked her to teach me the secrets of life and death, and I went through all these very scary tarot readings and had very frightening experiences, it was a really tough learning curve. But then suddenly it hit me. And, and a friend came to visit me. It was funny. A friend came to visit me in Oaxaca, and they got really upset because all of a sudden around me, and around us, they they saw death. So we went to the beach one day. I was showing them around, and they saw a dead turtle on the beach, and they were really upset. And then the next day, they turned on the fan because it's very hot there, and and a butterfly flew into the fan and it clipped off its the butterfly's wings, which was really sad. You know, this beautiful butterfly. So they came with me to the chapel, and they didn't speak Spanish, and they asked me to translate and speak to the sabia the wise woman there and they you know asked me to say to her why, why am i seeing all this death you know this is really disturbing me and she just said this is normal why are you worried about this everything and everyone will die and you know just the simplicity of her answer it just uh, struck me and and the fact that i had to be in these these death like situations I think that at a certain point when you work with Santa Muerte, you can just go deeper and deeper with her. And when you finally accept her fully and let death's embrace completely surround you, as I have done, then you find peace. Amazing. And yeah, beautiful. Um, I'm curious about, because it sounds like I've kind of gathered from some of the things you've alluded to, that in your own kind of path of devotion to Santa Muerte, there have been stages or potentially even um, um, kind of big experiences. I'm really curious about maybe some of your some of your stories about that path and podcasts love stories. It's number one, number one for podcasts. So um, uh, take us there. So I want to take you to a story that I didn't fully elaborate on in my book which I sort of brushed upon, but didn't because I was trying to hide my my identity for, for the longest time because I am an academic and I do teach at a university and there is, you know, stigma, unfortunately, in our world with people who are in the occult. So I think the day or the night rather that I truly embraced Santa Muerte and knew that I needed her in my life was that I was driving home from the chapel and 
it was light. And I try to make sure when I'm in Mexico, it, it's a, you know, not everywhere is super dangerous, but where I go to is quite dangerous. It's rural. There are cartels that operate. Everybody knows that. And by the way, not everyone who works for the cartel is evil. Okay. That's Some true. people are actually pretty decent. Uh, let's not go into that. But there are some dangerous people. So I try to, if I'm alone, always be home by sunset or before sunset. I'm not out alone in the dark at night. I'll go out with friends, family, whatever. That's fine. I'm, by family, I mean Mexican family. But I'm never out alone. So I've made this rule for myself. So one night I'm driving home and I thought, oh, I'm really hungry. I'll just stop off for a, a bite to eat. So I grab this bite to eat and I think I have time and I go to pay. And of course, their bank card machine is not working. This is Mexico. You should have cash, right? But whatever, I don't. So I have to go to the bank. I have to get this cash. And by the time I go and I come pay the, the restaurant, it's getting dark. And at that time, I made a mistake and I'll never do it again. I was living in the jungle. I was renting a small little house in the jungle and it was completely off the beaten path. You had to go down all these twisty, turny sand roads. There's no lights. There's no Wi-Fi. There's no phone signal. Nothing. And the path was really convoluted because there was just this long road and then there was all these other roads that went off of it. And I thought I knew the path. And I was not a good driver, by the way. I'm a horrible driver. <laughs> so I'm in this car. And I'm driving on this sandy road and there's all these bumps in it. And all of a sudden I crash my car really badly. Um, and I don't know where I am. I'm completely lost. It's in this jungle. It's dark. It's night. There are jaguars in this what? jungle, by the way. I, there are tarantulas. There God. are scorpions. It's like a Jurassic Park movie. Holy <laughs> And... And I go to my phone, I think, oh my God, I've crashed my car. It's now stuck between two trees, okay? And I don't know the way home because it's dark and I'm lost in this jungle. And just the other day, someone had told me, oh, by the way, you know that someone was killed close to you where you're renting. This woman was thrown off a cliff. What? <laughs> okay. So I'm like, oh my God. I, I've Is there more context to that, or just she was just randomly thrown off a cliff. Nobody knows what happens. They think she was murdered, yeah. and they never caught the people that that did it. So, and they were telling me, by the way, you should never rent again in the jungle. You need to stay in the village. What are you doing? Stay in the village where there are people. So anyway, so I'm stuck in between these two trees. My car is there. I can't reach anybody on my phone. I'm completely lost. I turn on the GPS, and of course, all these sand roads are not marked on a GPS, right? Because these are just dirt tracks. It's not like Google Maps is going to help me find my way home. So, and I'm a really bad driver. That's another story. Santa wanted to help me get my license to go to Mexico. Because before that, I was in living in London, right? I never drove. I just took the tube. You know how it is. And yeah. and the very day that I had to take my, my driving pass or pass to pass my test, I happened to have a Mexican instructor that basically winged me through the test so I could, because I told him, I'm going to Mexico. I need my driving, my driving license. He's like, no, you don't. In Mexico, you can drive illegally. I was like, I don't want to do that. But anyway, so I'm a really bad driver because I've just, this guy has basically given me my driving license because he's excited for me to go to Mexico. So I can't get my car out of this ravine. I'm stuck in between these two trees. And I just thought, what am I going to do? And all of a sudden, I see this big truck coming full of men. I don't know where they were going or what they were doing. And, and maybe it was perfectly innocent, you know, because I don't want to judge. I don't want to be racist. But as a woman, when you're alone, if you see a truck full of men anywhere at night, you're going to feel in, imperiled, right, endangered. So I turned off the lights of my car and... I sat down, I knelt in the ground, and I started praying to Santa Muerte. I said, please, Santa Muerte, I don't know where my home is. I don't know where I am. I can't reach anybody. I feel so alone right now. Please give me a miracle. And the truck went past. They didn't see me, didn't hear me, nothing. I put the keys in the ignition, and I just felt, I felt her spirit there. I felt her presence. And, you know, 
People describe her as a mother. She is a mother. She's a mother to many. And I felt her as a mother saying, it's going to be all right. Just get in your car, put it on. I'm going to help you through this. So I turn on the car and I just started kind of trying to go in and out of these, wiggle in and out of these trees that I was stuck between. And somehow, I I, I still don't know to this day how I did it. I got out and somehow the car wasn't damaged. And even though I was down in this ravine, somehow I managed to get up. And somehow she guided me home because I was completely turned around. I didn't know where I was. And and I just, I I got back to the house and I I was, you know, I was shaking. And then the next day I went to the chapel and told everyone what happened. And they said, of course, you've been coming to this chapel every day. You've been apprenticing. You want to write a book on her. She's keeping you safe. She is holding you safe within her bony arms. And you should thank her. So I did. I, I went to the chapel. I bought her flowers. I bought her a big bottle of, of mezcal, which is my drink of choice for Santa. Quite a story. So as you thought about that, you know, in the weeks after, did you come to any conclusions about it? or I came to the conclusion that you know, no matter what people have been trying to tell me in academia, you know, that as a scholar, as a PhD of Oxford, I cannot believe in Santa Muerte. Oh my God, what's wrong with you? Uh, Which is, I've been getting a lot of flack on that. I came to the conclusion, let me be rude because I'm very rarely rude, but as a British, well brought up young lady, let me be rude. I, I came to the conclusion, fuck them. Fuck them, <laughs> Santa Muerte. Yeah, the academics. Yeah, fuck those people who've been trying to tell me otherwise. She is la mera mera muerte, as they say in Mexico, which means she is the big boss death, and she definitely exists. But did that change your also? Did that change your relationship to teaching and academia and writing at that point? Yeah, it became very difficult dealing with, especially the old school scholars. I mean, I think there's a certain generation, and there's. Unfortunately, there's a lot of performativity around inclusivity and diversity. Yes, there is. Yeah. Um, and people will say that they're open to things, but I've had horrible situations. For example, once I gave a talk on Santa Muerte and and I brought with me because, you know, I have a load of of statues and candles and things. And when I go to to give lectures, I'll often bring them to me so people know what I'm talking about. So I, I gave this lengthy well, hopefully not too lengthy lecture on La Santa Muerte. And I had all these items with me. And a colleague of mine was supposed to be driving me home. And thereafter, he refused. And he said, I do not want this satanic stuff in my car. This was an academic? Yeah. What, what was this person's uh, credential? Like, what was their field of study? Religious studies. And let me tell you, they're not the only person in religious studies that has had this sort of attitude. Someone... I don't want to name names, but someone who's very well known in the field and even in relation to Santa Muerte, obviously, is an academic, not a devotee. When I brought my skeletons out of the closet, so to speak, told me, how could you as an Oxford doctoral academic, you know, who teaches at the University of British Columbia, how could you, and now I'm giving my identity away, but whatever, how could you venerate death how could you believe in this and and i hated that i mean i find that so racist and neo-colonial yeah. it's like yeah. it's like this whole terminology of going native you've gone native which but, is yeah, that's cool. not racist at all that's definitely yeah. not a racist statement um yeah i i mean this is i i am perpetually glad that i did not go the academic route although i wish i had in some ways but um yeah i mean like my basic view on this is is can you at least for the for the sake of intellectual clarity just for a second when you're studying these things can can you inhabit the worldview these people are actually inhabiting or like i was I was working i wrote a book about john d and every single and now we're talking about people who are highly educated from england you know so it's like but every single book and biography biography i read about him completely dismissed his worldview and it's like look 
you may not agree with this worldview. This worldview may have been proven to be pre-scientific and false, but if you're going to study this and write about it, like you know anything about it, like you need to take it on at least to understand it. I, I don't see why that's controversial, but that's actually really shocking. Or is it, they're like a bunch of Christians? I mean, like, not, not even. And you know, the worst thing is that the, I'm starting to distance myself from, from that whole thing, but there's a lot of academics who will, as you know, they'll go and they'll study these these religions, these spiritualities, including Santa Muerte, and then they'll impose their Eurocentric opinions, epistemologies, worldviews. We'll be smarter about that now, but yeah, absolutely. And so my work, you know, I'll, I'll admit my early work on Santa Muerte, my academic work is very based in functionalism. I mean, let's not go, go into a lesson on what that is unless you really want to. And although I think there is, okay, we can talk about functionalism. There is something to do with that where, you know, what is the function of turning to Santa Muerte? It, it is cathartic. You know, we can mediate strong relation, uh, re oh, see, feelings yeah. through her. You know, at the same point, when you start to impose all these theories upon this, these spiritualities, you're missing the point. You're trying to explain away in intellectualist terms, and then you're losing the mysticism the esoteric, the transcendental experiences that people have. And I find that most devotees working with Santa Muerte, yes, they ask her for practical favors. No. You want a hot date on a Saturday night. You want to get wild with someone. You can ask Santa Muerte. She doesn't judge. Ask La Niña Roja, the red lady. You want, you know, to, to avenge, have vengeance upon your enemies. Ask La Niña Negra. But there's also devotees will tell you that they have very deep spiritual experiences with her through visions, through dreams, through her helping them. And, and how are you, through functionalist or other intellectualist explanations, going to explain that if you're trying to use academic terminology that just really doesn't apply? Do you know um, Tobias Churton or know of him? No, I don't know him. He teaches at, or he, I believe he still teaches at the University of Exeter, and he was heading, I believe they had an esoteric studies program there for a while, but he's written like 20, 30 books, something like that on, on Hermeticism, Freemasonry, and he's kind of the biggest Crowley biographer. I've had him on the show many times. He wrote a six, vol a six volume set biography of Crowley, um, but he told me a story, which I, what, what you were saying just made me think of which I think about a lot, which is even he, I mean, like he's, he, he talks about Crowley and he's a very kind of cut and dry academic um, type person, but he says like he would be talking about Crowley and uh, at, I think he may have even said this was at Oxford, but that, that people who are like, I think he was talking to like science people or something like that. And somebody actually crossed themselves and like walked, uh, literally like crossed themselves when he mentioned Crowley and just kind of like slunk away into the background. It's like, wow. Like even at, in these centers of, this is kind of the crazy thing about being a magical person. You, you get to see how superstitious everyone is. Even supposedly hyper-educated people. It's like bizarre. Absolutely, Jason. And the ridiculous thing, and you've written about this in relationship to your work on John D. and Susan Greenwood, Josephson Storm has also touched upon this, is that this rift that's been created between science and religion or science and spirituality is, is completely imagined because science came out of spirituality. And I mean, I'm sure that you can speak more astutely and thoroughly on this than I can. But but science and religion were once so deeply intertwined. And even in the later years, you know, people like Marie Curie, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering radiation, I mean, she would attend spirit medium sessions with the famous spirit medium Eusebia Palladino to, to study this psychic phenomena. Mm. So, you know, we we always talk about science and we forget that there was also seance, you know, going on as Josephson. Storm has spoken about, and, and that many scientists are superstitious, are involved, and have been involved in, in magic and, and spirituality. And it's just this Manichaean dualistic framework that we have in you know Euro America 
that is actually pretty fake that we try to impose on everything. And that's what I love about Santa Muerte. It's a non-dualistic tradition. Yeah, definitely. Um, when I when I said um, superstitious, by the way, I didn't mean magical people who tend to not be superstitious just because they have so much experience dealing with these things and thinking through them and trying to rash, like rationally look at experiences. Um, but I mean people who have no exposure to it but then once they they could be like trained scientists but now they're crossing themselves if they hear the word crowley that's yeah, what but I, everybody is i know what you mean activity. jason and every everybody is and often when i start teaching a class i teach many classes on religion and spirituality um and i say to my students how many of you consider yourself to be religious or spiritual and very few nowadays raise their hand maybe spiritual but religious very few right but then I ask them, how many of you engage, you know, in, in witchcraft or some kind of, of magical ritual? Again, very few raise their hands, maybe some will. But then I say to them, how many of you before an exam use a good luck charm or have a very specific routine that you feel that you have to follow or have taboos, you know, things that you feel you can't do, for example, you know, can't have a cup of coffee after 11 o'clock, for example, could be something, or can't have a, you know, a very famous taboo, especially in the sporting world, don't have sex the night before, right? Because because that will ruin your performance, right? There's all Mike, these Mike taboos. Tyson thing, right? Yeah. yeah. And most students will put up their hand and I'll even ask them, give me examples. And they'll say, oh, they, they have a, a special sweater that they like to wear, or they have a necklace or they have a stone that they carry, or they have a certain routine. And I say to them, well, you just told me that you don't practice magic or have any special rituals or ceremonies. And look at you, you're all doing it. So people are very inherently superstitious, and people who claim to be scientific are still doing ritualistic magical practices. They just don't realize it. And then they go and judge other people for wholeheartedly embracing it. Yeah, I'm glad that you point out that this is like a totally uh, illusory separation. And um, yeah, it, it just really is. Um, I'm curious, because I definitely want to touch on this. Um, there was some point I was going to make, but I forgot. So I want to um, touch on back to Mexico. I'm curious about your meetings with curanderos or other um, devotees of Santa Muerte. What, what, uh, maybe some, some of the stories there, like some of the people are, I, I know you like to keep things anonymous, but maybe some of the experiences you've had with, uh, you know, some of the more intense experiences you've had kind of looking at, um, curanderos, uh, or people working with Santa Muerte and down there. Okay. So I'd like to talk about in, in the context of animism, and non-dualism. So animism is is a term, right, by originally coined by E.B. Tyler, who was an early armchair colonial anthropologist, right? He was in the colonial era. He wasn't a colonizer per se himself, but he supported the colonial venture. So animism used to be a dirty word, right? And he defined it as the belief that inanimate beings have an anima, so have a soul, have a spirit, right? But now this term has been resuscitated, and now we talk about new animism. If you're interested in it, there's the work of Graham Harvey, Nurit Bird, David, others. So new animism is the embracing of indigenous epistemologies around animism. And you know, even in Europe, early pagan Europe, we believed in animism. That you know, and this is a positive thing, by the way, because if you believe that your river has a spirit you're much less likely to start throwing trash, junk, garbage in the river. So I would say Santa Muerte is, is, is an animistic belief system because death is alive. And I started to very much realize this with this chapel, especially the one in Oaxaca, because I would hear these amazing stories about how the oldest statue in the chapel would, would leave at night and walk the highways to deliver messages and to speak to people. And that if people went in there to take a phone call into the chapel, she would literally start speaking to them in there through their phone. And I didn't have that experience with her for a long time until I got involved in the ritual bathing of the statues in this, in this chapel. And, you know, I, I've written about the ablutions that you should do 
on your altar. You should cleanse your altar regularly, and all the more important if you have a full chapel, right? So I asked this curandera, this witch who I was apprenticing with, which statue should I cleanse? And she pointed to the statue, and I thought, wow, it looks like this statue is smiling at me or kind of singling me out, but maybe I'm going crazy. But as I started to bathe her, so first you bathe her in normal, you know, soapy water to cleanse her, but then you have to create these herbal elixirs to bathe her, and then you dress her. As I did all of this, I felt that she loved it. I felt that she was smiling at me. And I felt we were really bonding and I felt her love and I felt her care and her embrace and her appreciation. And it was almost bringing tears to my eyes. And I could also feel all the people that had prayed to her and that had put their hope in her. And it, it just felt very powerful. And, and then the weirdest thing was at the end of the night, this bruja came up to me and she said, yeah, you've made her really happy. Look how she's been smiling at you all night long. Wow. So you got confirmation too. So I got confirmation oh. and it just sent chills down my spine. And from there on out, whenever I went to that chapel, I would take pictures with her. I mean, I'm not huge on selfies, but I would take pictures with her because I felt that I had this strong bond with her and I wanted to kind of record that. And I would look at the different pictures and the pictures that I took before the whole bathing, she looked kind of normal. But some of the pictures I took after the bathing, she literally looks like she's smiling. She literally has facial expressions. So I believe that these statues truly, if you bond with them and you connect with them, they take on the spirit of death and they will give you signs that people have told me, and I've seen it myself, they will move on your altar. Their side may move. They will send you messages. I believe and, it. I believe it. And, this, sound, this stuff sounds um, it sounds crazy to people who haven't experienced it, but yeah, that's, that's this stuff's for real. And when you're working with Santa Muerte, the whole tradition is animistic. So if you're working, as I recommend in the book, with herbs such as basil, which is very important, for example, for cleansing, you know, or, or with tobacco, you should thank the plants. You should thank the cigar. So, I mean, I've seen that in Mexico where the brujas will, will say things like puro, puro, te conjuro cigar, cigar, I conjure you, you know, I conjure up your spirit to, to work with me. So this faith is entirely animistic. And I've just had so many experiences, just eerie experiences that, that, that I cannot explain through, through logical thinking, you know, logical thinking is just inadequate. What are some of the other ones that come to mind? I mean, just the other day, I had the weirdest experience. I had promised Santa Muerte is some red roses for favors of, of, of love, for favors of the heart. And I was really tired after work. You know how it can be. You just had a long day. You just want to go home. You don't want to go and buy those roses. But I forced myself. I went to this florist. I got the roses. The minute I set off in my car, two cars in front of me, I see on the back of this car what looks like a red Santa Muerte statue. And I took a video of it. I took photos of it. And as I got closer, maybe it was a winch and it was a truck and it had a winch. But the way that the light was falling on it, it just indescribably looked exactly like Santa Muerte. And so I showed it to people afterwards. I showed the pictures and the videos because, I, you know, I like to take I like to be evidentiary as my as an academic, you know, I'm trying to collect evidence sometimes for these things. And I show people who are not even devotees, who are more of a scientific ilk and who know my background as a Santa Muerte devotee. And even they couldn't deny it. They said, that is uncanny. So I, you know, if you develop this bond with her, this relationship with her, these things do become regular occurrences. And after a while, you're not so weirded out by them. You're like, okay, this is just Santa Muerte manifesting herself to me once again. Yeah, this is, I think, I, I mean, that touches on just a, a really good point about doing magic in 2024, which which uh, um, it seems obvious in retrospect, but often is not because we have this idea of 
you know, magicians being shamans or medieval or being out in the woods or doing things with nature where it's like, well, if you do magic now as a normal modern person, you can be getting all these messages, not from flights of birds and stuff like that, but from license plates and experiences like you just described, or somebody, somebody can drive by with a bumper sticker that has some message on it that just like is completely cracks your head open and it's because it, there's no possible way that that message could show up at that time and it's kind of beyond synchronicity and into like actually some of the things you were talking about earlier like um divination uh methods where you can do divination with the city in the way you were talking about with candles and i think that that's just important to underline because it's i think people need to understand very much that magic is at least in my opinion, very much a way of life and a way of seeing the world. And it produces all these artifacts of symbols and objects and books and systems and things like that. But those are secondary to the the world. And I think if you get the worldview, you don't as much need to rely on the old museum of magic. That's my opinion on it. Yeah, my book is very helpful, I think, for people who, who seek those messages. Because as I said, it teaches you when you're burning candles, what are the symbols? What are the shapes that may come out? And and for me, frequently, I frequently had the shape of Santa Muerte. You know, if I'm burning a taper cam candle, especially for a magical rite or for a novena, I frequently had her. At, I mean, I could show you if I was in my altar room, but I'm not. I could show you literally wax that came out that looks exactly like the shape of Santa Muerte wearing her long. Gown, so I frequently have experiences like that, and but well, also I can, I, if you want to show it, I, I can wait. If you want to go? You grab. can wait. Okay, I can go grab that. Give me half a take. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know how well you can see this, but here is. Yeah. Is it okay if I put flowing? This, is it okay if I put this on YouTube? If this goes up on YouTube? Yeah. Here is. I don't know how well you can see it because I don't know how good my camera is. I can see it. Yeah. But you can see her gown is her head is here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! I can't see it. What the hell? Wow. And if you look at her from the side here, right? Yeah. Here is her head, and I have other statues that are more flowy. Yeah, that's pretty spot on. And let me try and look at the side as well. Yeah. Wow. What is it? Okay. Wow. No. Now you can see her, her head is right there, right at the top, and yeah. her gown gown is flowing down. Yeah. So see how her head is there and how she just... That's wild. Um, yeah. So what, so, was and the, story, what was the story by this one? Were you burning this candle? I was burning this candle for a friend um, who is also deeply devoted to, to death. Let's just call them parcialmente nublado. This is a shout out to you. They were asking me for, for protection. They're deeply connected to the blue Santa Muerte. And so they asked me for protection. And I, do you know why this is so eerie to me? Is that I asked the blue Santa Muerte to place her holy mantle, so her dress. That's what, because you can appeal to the different aspects of Santa Muerte for help, right? You, so you can ask for her side to cut out illness or wrongdoers. You can appeal, you know, for her to her globe to have you, you know, have power in your dominion. So I was specifically asking at this point with the mantle, her holy mantle, her her shawl, as it were, her gown that she wears to cover this person. So I burnt the blue candle, and and unfortunately, yeah, it's never as good on computer, but you can, can see that it. the mantle yeah. is is flowing down, and so that to me was was a confirmation that she was she was covering them. Thank you for showing that. It's incredible. Um, yeah. So I want to, um, I definitely want to ask you about how fast Santa Muerte is growing, the, the number of people devoted to it. Um, it sounds so practical and straightforward and it, it, I'm not surprised that it's so popular and so direct and it's like, you can't say death doesn't exist. Um, but talk about why it's growing so big. I mean, I remember I've even worked in offices in LA where I found out that somebody was a Santa Marte devotee, things like that. So, um, 
why is it growing so fast? How is it growing fast? What is it? What does that look like? And is it actually true that the Catholic Church is is quite upset about it? Oh yeah, they're definitely upset about it. I mean, the Argentinian Pope when he first came to Mexico decried her as a heretical and macabre symbol of death and of course associated her to narco traffickers, which is nonsense. Yes, narco traffickers. Sorry, I was about to say narco traficantes. I was putting on a Mexican accent. And narco traffickers do turn to her, but you know, they turn to other figures. They turn to there are narco traffickers who turn to God, who turn to Jesus, who turn to the Virgin. You know, so so that's just really erroneous. But I think it's because we've lost our relationship to death. And I think that so many people want to reclaim their relationship to death. And I think that if you think about it, Jason, we are all the products of death. Now, I'm not very good at math, so I might ask you to humor me here. Are you good at maths, Jason? I am, yeah. Okay, good. So imagine it took two parents for you to be here, right? How many grandparents? Four. How many great-grandparents? Eight. Was there how any, many? That's probably a logarithmic function for this or something. Um, how many great, great, great grandparents? Does it just double every time? Yeah, it's not exponential. Excuse me, exponential. It's not exponential. Well, I think it is because, wait, you know, for your. So this is what I'm point, talking does it just about. How many generation? I think how it, many deaths it took for you to be here? Right? How many generations lived and created life and then died for you to be here? This is what I'm talking about. We all had two parents four great-grandparents. Those four great-grandparents came, each one from two parents, right? This is why I'm telling you I'm not good at maths and I can't start doing this because it just grows exponentially. But think about the number of lives, Jason, that preceded yours and the deaths. The the, the people who were, you know, the non-humans who evolved into humans, like all the way back to the first protozoa or something. So, I mean, that just blows your mind when you think about that. I mean, hey, who needs to take magic mushrooms when you start trying to count up those numbers, okay? Um, So I think that we just all have this deep, long-standing connection to death, and it connects us all. We are connected through life and death, and I think that this spirituality allows us to recognize that. But as I said, she's also eminently practical. So what about about the, the spread of growth? What do you think? What do you attribute that to? And what's happening there too? Because I I don't know specifically how this is, uh, what this looks like. Well, I think one, she's very effective. And as I said, if she works for you, I mean, she's not always going to come through on everything, but on the whole, if she does come through, she will come through very rapidly. So I think that because of that, there's a lot of stories that spread by word of mouth, you know, and people thinking, well, hey, this person's got, this connection going on. And I I want to see if that works for me. And I think that, you know, as I said, because she's open to everybody, because everyone can connect with her and because death comes to us all. And also because it's such an open faith, as I said, you know, it's not one, it's not a closed practice. And two, because there aren't any strictures like with the Catholic church, you know, it's not like, okay, don't go out partying on a Saturday night and get completely bongoed because you'll go to hell. Right. Can I borrow that phrase, bongo? It's super funny. Yeah, you can. Um, yeah, I think that's a bit of onomatopoeia there, right? Because um, you can imagine people, ah. So yeah. anyway, because you can drink, you can have sex, you can engage in illegal activity. And I'm not saying everyone's doing that, but because there's no judgment, because it's judgment-free, I think that people find that very refreshing because you have so many religious bodies. The Catholic Church is is the primo example, right, of constantly telling us what not to do and what to do. Yet, meanwhile, there's all these sex scandals, uh, you know, they're accepting blood money, as it were, from, you know, different groups. And so there's just so much hypocrisy within religion, organized religion. And I think that people are fed up of that. And then I think that for pagan people, you know, for people who are already into paganism or, or new age movements, you can completely work with Santa Muerte. And because it's, as I said, there's heteropraxy, I find that people work in their own way with her. I mean, 
I'm not particularly working with her with a lot of crystals, but I spoke to somebody the other day, shout out to Simon de Luna, who's a great tarot reader. He's on TikTok, Insta, and a devotee of Santa Muerte. He was telling me that he works, he loves to work with, with crystals and Santa Muerte, you know, which is a unique way that he's found of working with her. And then, you know, I know people from Mexico who want to work with the more traditional ways. For example, as I said, you can work with her with tobacco, with cigars, right? With burros, as they call, as they call them. So I know one devotee or several devotees actually who work a lot with with burros. Like I know a bruja, a witch, who works with divination through cigars with Santa Muerte. So when you give her your cigar smoke, and you might do that through blowbacks or just smoking the cigar and blowing the smoke on her, you then see how the cigar opens. And if it opens like a flower, for example, that's a good sign if it looks like a flower. So there's just all these. And I know people who integrate chaos magic into that. Talk I know about that. Who, Talk about that. I mean, those devotees tend to not be from Mexico and who are more involved <laughs> um, uh, with sigil work and Euro European style witchcraft. And I know a, a fellow in, in England who does that a lot and goes out into the woods and conjures up what in Mexico they would call chaneque, you know, spirits of nature, which can mess with people and get in their head and drive them crazy and stuff. I know a guy who goes out and shout out to Ricardo Verde, you know who you are, I gave him a Mexican pseudonym there. But he goes out to the crossroads in the woods near his house down to like some witch's caves at night and then draws these sigils in the ground and summons Santa Muerte. So people find that. And now some people say, oh, this is wrong. Don't do that. But even in Mexico, you know, I find that people work with her in very distinct ways. Some people work with real old school prayer. Other people are working witchcraft, magic, brujería, like you wouldn't believe. I mean, I've been attacked by by witchcraft and had to fend that off. And believe you me, that was not an easy thing. It made me very, very sick for a while. So people work in, in what all... Happened there? What happened there? Um, I think there's a lot of... And, and you'll see this in the, in the book. I mean, the way of understanding the Santa Muerte epistemology is that it's, it's an osmotic world. Right. We're all, we think we're individuals. I hate the word individual. We're not, in anthropology, we talk about individuals. We're not discrete people. We're all interconnected with each other. And so we can get energy from other people when they dislike us or they have envy towards us. I mean, we all know about energy vampires, right? That person who comes into the room and drains your energy. So in Santa Muerte epistemology, we very much believe in that our relationships with other people can poison us, right? People who dislike us Absolutely. can send us evil eye, right? Mal de ojo. So there was someone, I think that they were very jealous of me and the work that I'm doing, which is why I like to stay in the shadows, right? As Ovid said, bene vixit, que bene la tuit. You know, he who, who lives well is he who lives quietly, you know, unknown, basically, uh, which is why I, tr I tried to, to stay in the shadows for a long time. But anyway, this, this devotee of Santa Muerte, I think, had an issue with me for whatever reason, jealousy, uh, competitiveness, and and I had, you know, I try not to put pictures of my altar out too much online, but I had a blue Santa Muerte and, and there are pictures of me online with her. And I think that she put an evil spirit in that Santa Muerte because one day I went to my altar and she just looked evil. And I started getting very tired, very sick. I couldn't get out of bed. I just felt completely drained. I felt completely off. I didn't feel myself, uh, my sense of of self confidence and self belief in what I could do and what I could not do was was just completely off. I didn't think I could achieve anything that I could write anything anymore. I mean, I was just completely sickened, and I didn't know what was going on initially. But then I realized it was witchcraft. I realized that some kind of hex had been done to me, and I looked at my blue Santa Muerte, and I had to take her off my altar. I had to give her a full cleansing. I had to cleanse myself. And the way that people work when they drain your energy through witchcraft, they will drain your energy so much that sometimes you can't even defend yourself. Yeah. 
like you forget to protect yourself or you don't have the energy to do the ritual yeah, that's at the, the end of that's the, day. the real that's the real dangerous bit i think yeah. So I got into that, you know, where I was, you know, doing things half-heartedly or every other day and I was too tired to continue. And then I started having dreams and a friend of mine said to me, no, you need to up the ante. You're letting them win here. So I had to start doing a lot of spiritual cleansing, a lot of practices, prayers, especially at night. I really recommend to people who are listening, you're very weak at night because you're sleeping right? So you can really be attacked unless you're protecting yourself at night. You're at your weakest because you're not aware of what's going on. And furthermore, if you drink or take sleeping pills or, you know, do drugs before sleeping, that even further um, can take down your defenses. And because during that time I wasn't well, I was taking sleeping pills. And thank goodness to a friend of mine who, who said to me, uh, she she makes beautiful Santa Muerte statues. Her name is, uh, she has a store called Santa Muerte Going Dutch. Now she's, you know, based in Holland, which shows you the diversity of this. She told me, oh. stop taking those sleeping pills. Uh, so if you're looking for beautiful handmade statues of, you know, non-Mexican origin, you can go there. Of course, there are beautiful statues in Mexico as well. But she said, these sleeping pills, they're allowing them to come in and attack you. So I stopped taking those and I, you know, started doing much more protective work and and eventually I lifted this thing off. But for anybody who's been attacked by witchcraft, you know, it feels surreal. Just things keep going wrong. You don't know why. You feel sick. And and Rome was not built in a day. It will take work and it will take time to lift the curse. If somebody is just getting interested, people who are hearing this, maybe, uh, well, first of all, I wanted to ask it's, I mean, you mentioned Holland, which is, that's, an, that's wow. I mean, wait, is this spreading all over the world? I mean, I've seen tons of it in, in Southern California, but is it? Is yeah, this is ubiquitous now. I mean, my book got published and translated recently in Polish because apparently there's a big cohort of devotees in in poland oh, yeah. <laughs> the eastern european version yeah this is going to be fun and, okay. and i think that you know it particularly has sway in those european catholic countries because right. this does stem from, this is in part folk catholicism so i think basically that, spreading know, catholic countries only no this spreads everywhere because as i said you know people can reinvent santa muerte i wouldn't say reinvent maybe that's not the right word but they can perceive her in their own cultural context so you know pagan people say in the uk you know there's there's a following there's a fellow in brighton who has a little chapel i believe to santa muerte um you know he he's a member of the lgbtq community and and he's really liked her because she accepts you know people from that community and, and people who can't go to church who feel ostracized from the church you know and and it's homophobia and all of that feel very welcomed by Santa Muerte. So you can still have your own church background, you know, and your desire to pray, but you can work with a deity who is not, who does not judge you for, for who you are. So I think that everybody can find beauty in her pagan people, people who are into new age, people who grew up in a Catholic household, but do not like what Catholicism has become. Um, people who are interested in indigenous traditions, um, someone even put me in touch with a, a devotee from India who, you know, finds great parallels with Kali, so has taken on Santa Muerte and her spirituality. There are people in Japan, I mean, all over. They, I mean, of course, most devotees are in Mexico, the U.S., and, and also the rest of Latin America. You'll find devotees in Costa Rica, Colombia, Puerto Rico, El Salvador, you know, etc. But but I think because we all die, that we can all relate to her. I had no idea it had spread so far. That's it's, it's, that's amazing. For people who are maybe, I mean, obviously the answer is getting your book, but um, for people who are interested in beginning to work with, well, actually, let me ask you this question. How can people know if they should work with Santa Muerte or not, or if they shouldn't? Is this like a you feel like calling type thing, or you just feel curious and you get started? I mean, who who should do this? 
Is there, should people have a certain sense of calling first? I don't want to dictate, you know, who should be doing anything. You know, I'm not the Pope around here. Um, I think that if you feel pulled to work with her, go ahead, you know, start your altar, potentially buy my book, learn about her, learn about her origins. I mean, if you don't want to buy my book, there's a wealth of information on well, your book as is, well. Your book is great, by the way. Uh, I know you razz me for missing the blood pack part, but it's it's a very practical book. I mean, it's a workbook, so uh, there's tons there. Yeah, and you can find tons online if you don't. You know, you're not at a point. You're not at the point ready to invest in in a book. You can start there. Um, I think that there's some people that will be naturally inclined to to work with her. As I said, people who've had near death experiences or or death of the self experiences where you've hit rock bottom and you just don't know quite how to pick yourself up. So I think that for those people that have a, a natural inclination, and there is in my book, again, I, I had controversy around that. There is a book about breaking the relationship with her. If you don't want to work with Santa Muerte anymore, if you feel that you've been there, done that, or it hasn't worked out for you, then I do have a ritual to part ways with her. Now, people have told me, well, you can never part ways with death. You know, death is is inherently part of our life. And this is true. But at the same point, I wanted to give people the option to respectfully step away from her, you know, and not just put their statues in, in a closet and forget about them or worse still, chuck them in the bin, you know, because that would just be so disrespectful. So I wanted to give them a path, a, a way of stepping away from her that would be respectful and correct so that they wouldn't get any backlash from that. Because we have to accept sometimes things work for certain people and sometimes things things don't. And you don't have to be mutually exclusivist, exclusivistic with her, mutually exclusivistic with her in the sense that if you want to turn to other deities, that's fine. But I do advise that you have her altar for her and her alone. Now, there are people in Mexico who don't do this, but I would say those people are usually people who have practiced for a long time. Or also it's because they work with other folk saints, uh, Mexican figures that are known to sort of get along with Santa Muerte. But for example, I would not recommend that you set up your altar where you already say have a figurine of the Buddha, for example. There should be respect there. She is a mother, a caring mother, but she can also be very tough and vengeful and deliver death to your enemies. And she can also be tough on you. I mean, she can teach you if you ask her for certain things, she can teach you tough life lessons, you know, mm. in, in the hardest of ways, as I have seen. So working with death is not for everybody. You know, you have to understand that death is a very powerful and intense force. If you want to work with someone gentle, you know, go and work, say, with, you know, white Tara, for example, you know, in the Buddhist tradition, for example, would be a, a kind of soothing yeah. energy to work with. Now, Quan, Quan Yin is always a good one. Um, I would love to keep talking, but we are at out of time. The, yes. to the end of our time here. But I want to make sure, where can people find out more about you, your work? And of course, your book is Secrets of Santa Muerte. Nope. Secrets of uh, Secrets of Santa Murte. And yeah, you it. can find my book on Amazon, any good bookstore, Barnes and Nobles. Um, very easy to find. And as for me, I'm on Instagram and TikTok, where I try to post content. I largely post a lot of beautiful pictures of of Santa Muerte shrines and devotion, but I also like to post prayers. And occasional sort of tips and tricks on on how to work with with Santa Muerte, and I also do tarot readings for my clients. You can you can DM me there. And the thing, my difference is that because I work with death, I mean, I've I've had incredible experiences where people have have reached out to me a lot related to death related questions, and I've even been involved because I do practice shamanism, curanderismo, in helping people transition as well if they have terminal illnesses. I mean, it was very beautiful this year. I really, or well, last year, I really wanted to go to Mexico for Dia de Muertos, but I had so much work that I could not. 
And so I said to Santa Muerte, if there's a reason you really want me to be here and not be in Mexico, please let it be known. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, my neighbor came to me and said, um, a friend of mine has decided that they are going to seek medical assistance in dying, what they call MAID, like euthanasia, basically. Could you please do a ritual for them to help them pass peacefully? So that is something also that I've gotten involved in. And I think that's really, really beautiful and, and touching work. So I think that when you work with death, whether it's tarot or shamanism, you're just absolutely open to everything. There's no judgment. And I think that's the difference as well with Catholicism, where, you know, suicide is kind of medic, even if it's medically assisted because someone has been in so much pain for so long would be considered inappropriate. But I think with Santa Muerte, you know, everything is is accepted. Yeah. Well, that was an awesome podcast. Thank you for for all that information. I'm sure the listeners are really, really going to enjoy that. And thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you so much, Jason. And I want to also thank all the curanderos and curanderas and brujas and brujos that have opened their hearts and homes to me and have taught me the path to, to Santa Muerte and Doña Marie. Doña Queta, thank you for accepting me in your chapel. I really appreciate that. And Parcialmente Nublado, thank you as well for your friendship. All right. Thank you very much for being on the show. 